Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you all for coming along. And uh, it always amazes me that after three and a half hours a day, people turn up at a lunchtime talk to hear me talk even more than I already have. It doesn't make a lot of sense. So um, first up, I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Wurundjeri people and the Kulin Nation. And I also look forward to the day when we not just acknowledge them and thank them, but also have a treaty or treaties with the traditional owners of this land. Long overdue, we're about 100 years behind other colonial nations. And why we haven't progressed and they have, I think, is a really important question. I'm not sure how best to be useful to you today, but I will try to do so. And I'm just as comfortable delivering a dialogue rather than a monologue. And if at various points I say something that you find outrageous or that you want to contradict or you want to add to or join in, I'm more than happy Instead of you waiting, poised, ready to pounce when we get to questions, you're welcome to wave your hand to me and we can just take it right then and there. While I was on holidays, the excellent people who are hosting you today here at the AIS invited me to suggest a topic for a talk that I'd agreed to do months before. I received the message while I was in the middle of outback Queensland sitting by a fire, surviving on baked beans and spaghetti jaffles. I lost a lot of weight, I might say. <laughs> Don't recommend it as the ideal way, but it did work. And I wasn't sure what I could talk about, and I was so far away and so disconnected from what I do the rest of the time that I made up a topic, and now, of course, I have to live up to it. Mythologies, paradox, and why the world's so confusing. Well. If I had all the answers, I guess I'd be a futurologist, I'd be a middle-aged man with a ponytail and I'd be charging myself out at $10,000 a day. So I'm not gonna pretend I've got all the answers, but I'd certainly have some of the questions. And I guess the easiest way to put it is like this. Democracy is a fragile machine. And like all fragile machines, if you don't put some grease on the axles and occasionally do some maintenance, change the oil and change the filters, it seizes up. And to use another motoring analogy, because although Sarah didn't say it, I am a notorious petrol head, although I don't like modern cars, I like old ones. To explain with more motoring analogies, when the internal combustion engine was invented in the 1890s or perfected and, and commercialised in the 1890s, it took another 10 to 15 years as cars became more common. It took another 10 or 15 years for rules to evolve about what that society changing technology actually meant. So it took ages to work out which side of the car to sit on, which side of the road the car went on, who gave way when two cars were heading for a collision. The idea of a licence took a while and the concept of insurance for cars and liability for cars took even longer. At the moment, Western society is facing similar society-changing technology. Social media, digital media, the extraordinary influx of computers into our daily life is changing the way we relate, the way we do commerce, the way we govern, the very way we live. But we haven't developed the rules to go with it. We're still in the phase of working out what it all means and how to apply that technology. The ACCC came down with a report just this week about coming up with some of those rules. I would say we're about 1% along the path. And while we're 99% short of the rules, that technology is governing us, it's ruling us, it's directing us. And again and again we're seeing where we're trying to catch up with changes that have already happened. So the great digital entrepreneurs, the billionaires, who are, in my view, little more than pirates, who have made unimaginable fortunes off the back of breaking the rules, breaking the model, 
and coming up with technology to which no rules apply are telling us that we have to leave them alone, that they have to be allowed to run their businesses the way they see fit, which is like Henry Ford saying, no one should need a licence to drive a car and insurance should not be mandatory if someone gets hurt. It's plainly, self-evidently, self-interested, self-serving nonsense and yet they're continuing to try and get away with it. And I remind you these are companies that don't respect the tax laws of the jurisdictions where they trade, they don't respect the media laws of the jurisdictions where they trade, they think they are transnational and they want to remain unaccountable. No other supplier of products or services in any developed Western economy gets away with making that argument. I am absolutely just stunned and gobsmacked at their audacity in trying to do the same. It beggars belief that they're indulged for even a moment, no matter how powerful they are. It's not in the public's interest. It just isn't. But we're seeing in this country at the moment in particular some sort of a crisis of regulation and accountability on so many fronts at once. The paradoxes I'm talking about, whilst we've never had better frameworks and better ideas on regulation and concepts and notions about keeping powerful entities and individuals to account, the paradox is we're not using them. There's an absolute failure, whether you're looking at the failure of captive regulators in nursing homes, in the banking industry, over the weekend, we've seen revelations about the Department of Home Security or Home Affairs or whatever Peter Dutton's decided to call what used to be a service but is now called a force, border force, a failure to keep us safe from questionable figures with crime connections in China who have untraceable money in the hundreds of millions that they are laundering through supposedly regulated Australian casinos. Spare me. On every level, there's a fail on who's allowed to come, on how they're checked when they come, who is bringing them here. The casino, when it was first licensed in this city, we were told, would be subject to the strictest regulatory regime the world has ever seen. And what happened? So the nonsense that gets put out as policy has to be called out for what it is. Yet here's the problem, whether we're looking at the banking sector or nursing homes or rubbish recycling, we export rubbish. We actually package up empty cans, glass bottles, plastic and cardboard. We gift wrap it and send it off to Indonesia and China. Is the top of your head exploding like mine is? It's beyond belief. And so what we're seeing over and over again is that we're being let down. Now, it's no fresh remark to say that Australia has excelled as a quarry. At the moment, this city is becoming almost dependent on providing a first world education to the offspring of the bourgeoisie of Asia who can't get their kids into Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard or UCAL, but can get them into universities in Australia. So the elites in China and in Malaysia and wherever else in Asia and India, the absolute top billionaire elites, their kids go off to California, to Harvard, to the United Kingdom. But the next level down, well, they get Australia. And we are making a lot of money and this city is almost becoming dependent on providing educational services. Our two biggest employers in Victoria at the moment, since the closure of the car industry, which I still regard as the greatest act of sabotage and vandalism in our lifetime in the Australian economy. But setting that aside, because don't get me started, I'll go forever. We are now... What is the biggest single employer in metropolitan Melbourne? Anybody? The casino. Which sector provides more jobs than any other in Melbourne at the moment? 
educating overseas students. The construction industry depends on it and on and on we can go. That's not the vision of Australia. I don't think many of us have had of being the clever progressive country. And yet that's what we've decided to do. We've gone for the quick buck and we've said to hell with the consequences. We'll grab it now and work out what it means later on. The short termism that absolutely dominates, which masquerades, which passes as public policy at the moment in Australia, is just all, it's, all we're doing is we're just kicking the problems down the road. And we're saying, and gosh, I'm looking around the room, us baby boomers, we've been shocking, haven't we? We got a free education, we had the opportunity to get a permanent job, we had houses that we could afford to buy, and we visited what upon our kids? None of those things. They come out of an education, if they get a tertiary education at all, they're saddled with debt, there's no such thing as a starting job. It's all casualisation or unpaid internships before you've learned, earned your stripes. And housing has never been more unaffordable. Indeed, unless it's, as Malcolm Turnbull famously said in an interview with me, and it wasn't the last interview, but it was the last one where he smiled, it's the bank of mum and dad. And without it, you're sunk. Well, what does that tell us about entrenching privilege and wealth and inheritance as a marker for the future of this country. And we prided ourselves on being a country of equals, a country where, unlike the United Kingdom, unlike monarchy-based uh, regimes in Europe, people weren't born into privilege. This was a meritocracy. This was a country where you stood on your own two feet and you earned respect instead of being born to expect respect. So I find it deeply troubling that some of the values I thought were fundamental to the Australian character and Australian politics, the economy and society are being pretty much sold out. So that's the mythology, the mythology of who we are as a nation. Walk down the street, you'll see we're far more ethnically diverse than the media will show. We are much, much more, much, much more dependent on recent arrivals, people who are born overseas or whose parents were born overseas. We are a Eurasian nation, but clinging desperately to the mythology that we're not and we're still, in fact, an Anglo and Christian nation. I know that the work of this organisation, AIS, for a long time has been breaking down barriers and working for improved harmony in the community. On that, there is a favourite bugbear of mine, which is... I hear over and over again when I go to various functions, people saying how we need to be more tolerant. And I hate that word tolerance. I don't want people tolerating me because they say, oh, you're different, but I'll tolerate you. And that's part of the supposed perceived wisdom anyway of the multicultural uh, mantra. I want that word abolished. I want it replaced with inclusive, welcoming, hospitable, anything other than tolerate. And slowly, slowly, I'll just keep chipping away and maybe when I'm, you know, long gone, there'll be a little headstone above my ashes after the vultures have carried away the best bits and say, yeah, we tolerated him, but that would be someone's revenge. But no, tolerance, if you do use it, if it is in your vocabulary, think again, it's a, a most inappropriate term. And it very much denotes the mindset of uh, uh, a dominant majority <coughs> welcoming in the other and saying, yes, that's fine, you can come in and I'll tolerate you, which is pretty much the mindset behind it. Surely we, we are better, we can do better than that. And words have meaning. Words are very powerful. They mean a lot. And each word should be very carefully chosen and in this instance, in my view, discarded. There are much better ways of making people feel that they're welcome, that they're included, and that they are equal, rather than resorting to some of those. Glad I got that one off my chest. I feel better already. <laughs> so where are we? We're a democracy. 
We're proud of being a democracy. I'm sure we'll always be a democracy. But we do have some flaws at the moment. Just today I interviewed a member of federal parliament who sits on a committee that's been reviewing question time. As I was driving yesterday, listening to news radio, 1026 on your dial, a service much neglected but provided by the ABC, and I was listening to politicians not answering and not being compelled by the speaker to answer questions from the opposition and then using up as much time as possible answering Dorothy Dix's from their own colleagues. And I thought, really, that's a mockery. That's a mockery of a parliament. New Zealand doesn't do it. Canada doesn't do it. England doesn't do it. You know, you go to the Houses of Commons, Westminster, they don't put up with that nonsense. Why have we? Why have we got into this, this masquerade, this complete nonsense of pretending that Parliament is holding people in power to account? Senate estimates holds people in power to account. But question time doesn't. So we had furious agreement, this Member of Parliament and me, but then he was from the Labor Party. So I guess if they were in power, they'd probably be saying the exact opposite and the Liberal Party would be arguing that question time needs reform and there's that short-termism creeping in again. So there's all sorts of vulnerabilities and I've only picked on one or two. Globally, we're incredibly vulnerable at the moment. Again, I've just come from interviewing the excellent Bastian Obermeyer, who is in town promoting his book on the Panama Papers. Millions of documents leaked from somebody, still anonymous, that provided us with a unique insight into how untold billions, if not trillions of dollars, wash around the world from third world dictators, fraud on aid and military expenditure, uh, Vladimir Putin's best friend, a professional cellist, has $2 billion in the bank. Cellists, we all know, are much loved and cherished even in Russia, but $2 billion for a man who's never done anything other than perform on the cello? I think we're entitled to ask how come. So all of these issues, all of these issues swirl around and our governments twiddle their thumb, thumbs and don't seem to come to grips with any sense of urgency to some of these issues. We're told though that the threat of global terrorism is so great that extraordinary powers have to be invoked in order to keep us safe. But what about the threat of global fraud? There's far more damage done there and yet no one is prepared to address it. Which brings me finally to keeping people in power to account. I work for an organisation that from time to time gets a bit of criticism, believe it or not. I know this will come as a huge shock to you all. Um, but later this year I'll do my last show on October the 11th. You're all invited to come along. And I'll hang up after 30 years working at the ABC. And during that time, I've always regarded myself as just a tiny little link in a very long and I might say mostly honourable chain. And it's been a great privilege to play that role. But as I draw my broadcasting years to a close, I'm deeply troubled at whether or not the next 30 years is going to look anything like my 30 years since I joined the ABC in 1989. And I fear very much that, as we are with some other areas, we're going to look back with a sense of nostalgia, but also disappointment. As Sarah mentioned, I was a, a lawyer before I joined the ABC, and in that time I was quite active. I did four years in commercial litigation, which is a barrel of laughs, and then I was three years working as the principal lawyer at Fitzroy Legal Service, and we fondly thought, those of us who were working in law reform and access to justice. We fondly believed back then, and kind of with a bit of a wry smile now, we thought that progress was inevitable and linear. It went along on a line. And as time went, just progress happened. And now we know that's not true. There's nothing inevitable about progress, and it doesn't happen just by the passing of time. In fact, progress goes up and down like the stock market. And unless you make it happen, it will not happen. In fact, we can and we have on some areas gone backwards. 
So if we cherish some of those values that informed us, then we have to actually be strategic in making sure that that progress continues. Because there are people who don't like it. There are people, for instance, who are embarking on a political career determined to undo same-sex marriage, abortion reform, voluntary assisted dying and so on. There are people who are dedicated to putting to the sword things that many others regard as progress. There are people who want to change society and do away with some of what I personally regard as good initiatives that have improved our community, made it more equal, made it fairer, made it more accessible for people. Not everyone sees it the same way. And there's a certain, maybe it's a complacence or maybe it's an arrogance that some of us have developed over time. If we don't actually work and work hard to maintain that machine, it can seize up. And in fact, it can break. We're seeing it overseas. We're seeing in Italy a majority of people under 30 question whether democracy is the best way to run a country. You're seeing the reaction in Hong Kong from young people there. Not as was said on the radio this morning, it's not the older folk who have grown up with the colonial and democratic traditions of Hong Kong, it's the young people who are terrified that they're not going to have what their parents and grandparents had and they don't want to live the way people on mainland China are forced to live. They're the ones who are rioting, they're the ones who are causing trouble. They're the ones who are fighting for what we take for granted. And so on, we could go all around the world. I'm not for a minute going to even pretend to explain what's going on in the United States of America. And anyone who says they can explain it is a liar just at the moment. I'm quite frank in telling you that. So we are living in a difficult time. We're living in a troubling world. I am, though, eternally optimistic. I'm... I find it impossible to accept that some of what in the last couple of years has so troubled us and so um, confused us, I find it impossible to accept. My optimism will not let me accept that that is going to in any way be an ongoing state of affairs. I may or may not, I think I will probably live to see another revolution in China. I hope I live to see a popular revolt in corrupt Russia. I very much hope I see a return to common sense in the United States, but as so many people do remark, the trouble with common sense is it's not that common. But we will see. And here in Australia, here in Australia, well, I would like to see, and I don't care who's in power, as long as they exercise that power appropriately. But when people in power refuse to be accountable, that's when we've got a problem. And just finally, about the ABC, the next couple of years is going to be very challenging for an organisation that's dear to my heart. It's going to see further cutbacks, it's going to lose 5% uh, or more of its funding, and that means it's going to lose 5% or more, given that almost all the costs in the ABC are fixed staff costs. They're going to lose somewhere around between 5 and 10% of staff, and that means they're going to lose people who make programs. There's no fat left to cut. It just does mean, it absolutely means that you, the public, will get less out of the organisation. Now, I do not excuse the fact that, as I said to the managing director on air last week, there are programs we make on TV that no one watches. There are websites that people work on that hardly anybody clicks on. There are radio programs and podcasts that we make and hardly anyone listens to them. We have to get rid of some of the stuff that's not particularly productive, but there is stuff that's not popular but still very important. And we have to come up with a process to work out where those cuts are going to fall. I do not envy them the task. So I'm sad to be walking away at a time when I think the organisation is going to go through hard times. On the other hand, I've spoken to you today strictly within ABC guidelines. Just wait till I'm off the leash later this year. <laughs> I hope that's been vaguely useful to you. And at the risk of wearing out my welcome, I'm happy to answer questions if there indeed are any. So thank you very much.